we've got 55 million people worldwide that have Alzheimer's disease. That number is going to triple by the year 2050. And in my opinion, it's going to be the collapse of our healthcare system. And you know, when I look at the literature, I, I, I publish, that's what I, I, as an academic, and so I read studies after studies after studies, and I truly believe that it's around 1% is driven through genetics and 99% is through lifestyle. So you oh think, well, goodness. what, what yeah. does that even mean? It isn't about being perfect. It's about being better. Hello, my name is Dr. Stephanie Stima, and I host expert discussions with thought leaders in all facets of health, including nutrition, fitness, hormones, stress management, performance, recovery, longevity, health span, and energy production. On this show, we discuss complex science, but then we also alchemize it into actionable everyday living. The ultimate goal with the show is to assist you in making informed decisions about your health, and to catapult you into being the hero in your own life. Hey, hey, friends, welcome back to another episode of Better with Dr. Stephanie. It's me, your host, Dr. Stephanie Estima. And today I am welcoming my friend, Luisa Nicola, to the show. We are talking all about brain health, cognitive decline, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease, all of which affect women at a much higher rate than they do men. Louisa, a little bit of background on her. She founded NeuroAthletics, which is a multi-enterprise consulting firm providing scientific strategies to help athletes and investors achieve peak performance. Louisa was a world champion athlete and raced both nationally and internationally for Australia. She retired in 2012 and followed her dreams, went to Sydney Medical School and graduated with a particular interest in neurophysiology. So what did we talk about today? Well, we start off talking about dementia, cognitive decline, and its relation to Alzheimer's because we know that Alzheimer's affects women far more than it does our beautiful men. We talk about some of the ways that we can increase the clearance of things like amyloid beta plaques and tau tangles, which are some of the two main pathophysiological markers that we see in Alzheimer's disease. We talk about sleep. We talk about exercise. We talk about nutrition and supplementation. And we talk about within exercise, we talk about cardiovascular work, the different types of cardiovascular work and resistance training. And then of course we talk about other peripherals. We talk about sauna. We talk about cold plunging, many, many, many actionable items that are here in this episode. If you are in perimenopause or menopause, or you have a woman that you love who is in perimenopause or menopause, send them this episode because this is going to be chock full of information on what some of the changes are in the female brain as we age, some of these trophic factors that decline, like our sex hormones, and we talk about how we can actually age well. Imagine that. So please enjoy my conversation with Luisa Nicola. All right, Louisa Nicola, how are you? And welcome to the show. Stephanie, thank you so much for having me. This has been a long time coming. Long time coming. Let's let's talk, let's kind of start uh, with Alzheimer's, then we can work our way through some of the other um, aspects here. Uh, I've heard you talk about this idea that three to 5% uh, of Alzheimer's is genetically driven, said mm. another way, 95 to 97% of Alzheimer's disease is not genetically driven, which is, I always find it fascinating when you say, oh, three to 5% is, is driven by genetics. It's like, all right, flip that around. And now we have a huge number, 95 to 97% is not mm. genetically driven. So let's talk a little bit about a, why the hell is this happening? Yeah. And then we can kind of get into some of the different classifications of Alzheimer's that maybe affect fe uh, females a little bit more than males, if there are that. Yeah. And, you know, that statistic shocked me as well. You were, we've got 55 million people worldwide that have Alzheimer's disease. That number is going to triple by the year 2050. And in my opinion, it's going to be the collapse of our healthcare system. And, you know, when I look at the literature, I, I, I publish, that's what I, as an academic. And so I read studies after studies after studies. And I would actually be remiss if I didn't correct you and say that I truly believe that it's around 1% is driven through genetics and 99% is through lifestyle. So you oh think, well, goodness. what, what yeah. does that even mean? So first and foremost, let's just define what we're talking about here. Dementia is the umbrella term. When we say dementia, we are really talking about a disease that is affecting our cognition, 
Our cognition is our cognitive performances such as uh, thinking, processing, speed, memory. We've got working memory. We've got episodic memory. These things start to decline. And what I hear a lot of is people still think that dementia is a natural part of aging, but it's not. It actually isn't. It's a disruption in the network of our brain cells. So if it's okay with you, just as an educator, I like to do a lot of we, we can do some neuroscience one on one. Even though I know that your your listeners are, are highly probably trained in this field, but just to allow for the episode to flow, we've got around eighty seven billion neurons in the human brain. It's around three and a half pounds our brain, and it's responsible for everything we do, who we are, what what, what we see, how we interpret information, how we associate things, even down to the person you choose to marry is all dependent on how your brain is functioning. And the way that it functions, we've got the structural aspect of the brain, that's the hardware, that is the actual brain tissue. Then we've got the way that it's functioning. So that's how your cells interact with one another. And that network of cells, you've had Dale Bredesen on and it's incredible, you know, even what he says. Our brain is around three and a half pounds of tissue. Then we've got per neuron, we've got around 87 billion neurons. Per neuron, you've got around five to 10,000 connections. So you have to imagine this network in your brain. That's the functioning of the brain. Now, Alzheimer's disease, okay, it is, it sits under the umbrella of dementia. We've got many types of dementia. We've got dementia with Lewy bodies. We've got Parkinson's dementia. We've got vascular dementia. Alzheimer's disease is a form of dementia. However, it is marked by two things. It is marked by amyloid beta, which is a protein, and tau protein. So these two things make it different from the other types of dementia. And it's the most prominent one. So What we see now, and this is what I'm learning in the literature, is that it's not just a disease of the cells itself, it's a disease of the network in our brain, meaning that this this cognitive decline that we experience is not just a degeneration in the cell body and in the axon of the cell, it's a degeneration in the network, in the way that each cell communicates with each other. So the way that we think and act and have thoughts and talk, we create an electrical signal called a synapse. And that's when one neuron connects with the other one. And when we have dementia or when we have cognitive decline, we have a, an insufficiency of the brain cells to do that. And I think that that's, that is quite scary. I also think, Stephanie, that what is quite scary to me is that we are spending billions of dollars trying to get to space and yet we haven't figured out a disease that robs us of who we are and makes us forget who our children are. So that's what Alzheimer's disease is as a, let's just think about it like that. Now let's move into the question where you said, well, why, why is only 1% driven by genetics and 99% driven by lifestyle? Because everything we do affects the functioning of our brain. So what we find, let's look at the, it's, it's really important to differentiate as well between a genetic mutation and genetics in terms of risk factors. When we think about mutations, okay, that is a disruption in our genetic code. For example, if you have a if you have a, an insufficiency on chromosome four, okay, you will get Huntington's disease. We know that, right? It's something that you are born with; you can't change. When it comes to Alzheimer's disease, there's around thirty genes involved, but there's only really three that, if you get this, it's a foregone conclusion that you will get the disease. Okay, that is if you've possess the genes presenilin 1, presenilin 2, and the amyloid precursor protein. If you've got a mutation in these three, you will definitely get some form of dementia. And that's what makes up that 1% to 3% of the population who have Alzheimer's disease. But the rest of the people who have this disease either possess the risk factor genes, meaning that they've got the genes that increase the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease, or they don't even have the risk factor genes and they've just gotten there through poor lifestyle habits. So it's scary. And and we'll talk about that more. Yeah. I think you brought up a really good point with the tau tangles and the amyloid 
beta plex. I, I want you to maybe just expand on that a moment because I think that amyloid has generally been vilified. When yeah. Dr. Bredesen was on the show, he's been on the show multiple times. One of the things that he said is that it's made by the brain, right? Like it's made by the brain oh, yeah. and it is neuro, in, in, a, in a way it is protective. And we also certainly have evidence of, you know, having the, having the presence of amyloid beta and these tau tangles doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get Alzheimer's. Like you can have the presence of those things and not have, let's say, cognitive decline. So talk a little bit about amyloid beta, its, it's, its function, its use. And yeah, let, let's start there. Yeah. If you look back 30 years ago, Alzheimer's disease actually had a a diagnosis of, you know, we used to call Alzheimer's disease the amyloid cascade hypothesis, a hypothesis because we believed, or scientists believe, that if you get a, a head full of amyloid, that's what is causing the disruption between the cells and that is what is causing uh, Alzheimer's disease to occur. But we now have evidence through MRI imaging that you can have a head full of amyloid and still perform optimally cognitively. We've seen people in their 90s with a head full of amyloid, but their cognition is still on point. So amyloid is a protein and we all have it. And it builds up in the brain in response to an immunity attack. So for example, when we are under stress, any type of stress, we activate our innate immune system. That is the primary immune system that gets activated to kind of shield you and, and defend you against infections and against inflammation, et cetera. So we're always building up amyloid to protect us because your brain is really built for two things, survival and reproduction, right? So it's always trying to protect you and it's trying to keep you alive. In, the, in 2024, really keeping us alive now, your brain, you send the same signals to your brain when you get a notification on your phone that you don't want as what we did 50 or 100 years ago when a tiger was running after us, right? So we would protect the brain to make sure it survives and we can reproduce by producing amyloid. And what happens is when we, when we have a great diet, when we exercise and when we sleep especially, we have the ability to clean out that protein so it doesn't build up and end up causing these aggregates. Amyloid exists, and when it builds up, it actually builds up outside of the neuron. So remember, we've got around 87 billion neurons. This forms outside, and it forms where the glial cells are actually sitting. So the glial cells are our chief immunity brain cells. So they're really there to serve and protect, and they act like glue between the two neurons. And that's where we're seeing the amyloid build up. And that's getting into in the way of the two brain cells communicating. Conversely, you've got tau, which is also another protein that we see, another toxic protein, if you will. But the difference here is tau actually lives in the microtubules of the axon. So if you imagine, if the people listening there haven't really understood what the axon is, you've got the cell body of the neuron, you've got this leg that comes off it. And during that axon, inside that, this is where we process all of our, that's where information processing speed happens. And that's where we get what we call conduction velocity, a speed of thought, for example. And if we have tau that builds up within the axon, what happens is, if you imagine uh, a roller coaster and you've got the, the, the railway tracks on, or in, on a train or a roller coaster, you know those railway tracks, that's what it's like, right? Let's just say that the roller coaster stops. What ends up happening is you get the collapse of those microtubules because the roller coaster stops and ends up putting too much pressure on the, on the railway tracks and ends up splitting apart. That's what happens when we build up too much tau in the microtubules. We end up getting a collapse in the axon. So that ends up, you know, what happens then? Well, we end up with neurodegeneration because you've killed off, you know, predominantly a brain cell, but we also can't think and process information properly. And just on that as well, because I know you mentioned autoimmune diseases, there is a specific disease that I think 80% of the diagnosis are made from women and that's multiple sclerosis. I remember working in clinical practice. Yeah. I had, I had to do EMGs, electromyographies, and we would be picking up on early signs of MS. And what happens is 
the conduction velocity on that axon is slow or it's completely blocked, which would signify a multiple sclerosis diagnosis. So yeah, we've got so many things at play here. So when we're talking about lifestyle and we're talking about the buildup, so if we understand that, let's say amyloid and tau, these are sort of the brain's reaction to stress, you stress, distress, chronic mm. low-grade stress, where we have a clearance problem, you mentioned lifestyle. And if one, if, mm. if one to 3% of it, let's say, is genetic and 97 to 99% of it is lifestyle, what are some of the things that we can start thinking about as ways to attenuate that risk, as ways to speed up, let's say, the clearance or the accumulation mm. of some of these proteins that are uh, undesirable in larger quantities? I really like that question because you're attacking it from, well, we all know that we're going to build up amyloid. Just to paint a picture, we the, the latest drug that's been approved, Lakembi or Lakanumab, it's a monoclonal antibody. What we've seen in the trials, and this was printed in the New England Journal of Medicine late in 2023, was that when you do this IV drug, it's a drug now used for the clearance of amyloid. And what they found is that during the process of clearing brains of amyloid to try and help with uh, Alzheimer's disease, I guess, what you're, accum what you're actually doing is you're causing brain bleeds in the process of doing that. But what they did find was that there was around 4.5 grams of amyloid in these Alzheimer's disease patients that they're trying to clear out. So I'm really happy that you're thinking about this in the sense of, we know it's going to exist. We know that compound interest exists in biology. It's not just in finance. So we know that if it does exist, what do we have to do to protect our brain to not only maybe stop it from occurring slightly, but also when it does occur, how do I bring it down? It all comes down, in my opinion, to chronic inflammation. And I think chronic inflammation really sits at the seat of this disease. So how do we mitigate inflammation? Let's just say you wake up and you've had, you've had, you know, you've had a bad day, right? You know, you've been stressed completely. Maybe you haven't, you haven't been eating well. The one thing that you can do to protect and serve your brain before anything, in my opinion, is exercise. And we're going to go up the pyramid of what I call, uh, we have a pyramid at neuroathletics and it's at the bottom of the pyramid is exercise, sleep, and then nutrition. And then we've got some accessory items. So let's talk about how exercise can serve as a, both a clearance of amyloid beta, because we've seen this actually, but also how can it uh, protect and serve us. In terms of a clearance of amyloid beta, we see that Long bouts of aerobic training, like in your zone two training, can actually help with expression of BDNF. BDNF is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's a growth factor for the brain. We've seen that through the expression of BDNF, we can actually clear out amyloid. So that's one aspect. So running, doing your long distance running, your long distance cycling, your long distance swimming, anything that is zone two aerobically based for long periods of time is going to get slight improvements in the clearance of amyloid. This is also occurring through blood flow. And I think that this is actually one of the reasons why exercise is so good for the brain, because you are improving the amount of blood that is getting shunted to the brain. So your brain is the most vascular rich organ in the entire body. I think if you were to pull apart all of the blood vessels in the brain, you would be able to span, I think it's like 400 kilometers or 400 miles. I know they're two very big differences, but it's, <laughs> it's one or the other. And I know, so that just tells us that there is so much brain vessels in the brain. There is so much cerebral blood flow that we need. So the more blood you're pumping to the brain, the more oxygen and nutrients you're getting to the brain. Not just that, we have these tiny little vessels in the brain called capillaries, they are these one cell thick blood vessels that really serve a huge purpose. And unfortunately, what we see during stressful events or even during minor, mild hypertensive states, that's when your blood pressure is rising over the classic 120 over 80, we see the literal like killing off of these tiny little uh, capillaries that actually serve a big purpose in the brain. So Zone two cardio, very good for the trophic support, B12, 
BDNF is a is a trophic support, but also good for blood th- blood flow, and also good for the growth and proliferation of new neurons in the hippocampus, which is the seahorse shaped structure deep in the temporal lobes, which is the first thing to go during Alzheimer's disease. And just to interrupt you for a moment, for those of you that are unfamiliar with zone two, this is when we think about intensity, often uh, cardiovascular activity is zone one, two, three, four, depending on who you talk to, five, six, uh, maybe even seven, some schools of thought, but basically zone two is, it's intense enough that you're kind of heavily breathing. But if you and I are on a bike or on a walk or something, an intense brisk walk, we can still carry out a conversation, but we're just like breathing a little heavier. It's like, you know, you got your little late night FM DJ voice, you know, it's like a little bit breathier, a little huskier, a little bit more air there, but you can still carry on a conversation versus something like a five or a six for my Bettys who always want to feel like they're dying. You know, this is like very high intensity uh, super maximal or even like, you know, what's often just called hit high intensity interval training. So zone two is what you're talking about here. And just for an actionable recommendation, when we are thinking about how many minutes, hours we should be spending in zone two, let's say on a weekly basis, your recommendation generally is a minimum of three hours a week, three hours a week. Okay. So twer- yeah. twerking counts, and, right? Twerking counts. Uh, and <laughs> and <laughs> if, if you've got that zone two yeah. heart rate and yeah. yeah. And look, zone two is, is also phenomenal for the, the change in your heart structure. So we, you know, when we exercise and when we put our heart under stress, we are doing something called cardiac remodeling. So you can, you have the chance to remodel your entire cardiac system. And we'll talk more about that during VO2 max. Word of caution, because I do get this a lot. I know that there are a lot of female led hormonal scientists and physicians out there who kind of diminish zone two and say, yes. say that women yes. shouldn't be doing zone two. So I'm, I'm talking from a clear brain health perspective. I'm not talking about it from a a hormonal and fat burning perspective. Well, I'm going to just add to that because I know who you're talking about and names are not necessary. At least there's one that pops into my mind as you're talking. And one of the, like the, the argument is often, well, in menopause and perimenopause, you know, women already have, you know, our mitochondrial capacity is already upregulated, our type one fibers, et cetera. So we don't need as much zone two as let's say our male counterparts. But then what is maybe not considered is the loss of these hormones, which is something that I've never quite Mm. understood because now you have that trophic, you have that loss of these anabolic, these growth oriented hormones, estrogen and testosterone specifically. And then our cardiac risk profile now begins to look like our men, right? We see cardiovascular Mm. disease you know, there's this phasic shift that we see with women where, you know, under the influence of estrogen, very cardioprotective, vasodilation, vasoconstriction. And then we lose estrogen in, you know, we become estrogen deficient through perimenopause and then of course through that menopausal transition. So if anything, I would say that zone two becomes more important in, in menopause and in our later years in order mm-hmm. to affect the same cardio respiratory benefits that is often recommended for men because now we have bodies that are in some ways, in some cases, like less estrogen than our male counterparts in, 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 in menopause. Right. So I know, I know you're being careful and I, I completely appreciate that. And I'll say that I disagree with that line of thinking. I think that zone two is very important for a perimenopausal and menopausal woman. I do too, because I think you're also building your aerobic base. We, we now have substantial evidence to show that our peak aerobic efficiency or our VO2 max, the measure of our peak cardiorespiratory fitness is a fantastic measure for our longevity and all cause mortality. Yeah. Meaning that really the fitter you are, the longer you will live. That is just, you know, the more oxygen you're able to deliver more effectively and more efficiently to the rest of the body, which is means that we will be able to live longer because we'll be able to deliver oxygen better as we, as we go through, you know, to 90 and hundred. So what you're doing in zone two, you are building that base, that aerobic base. That's why I like that. Also, we have to understand one thing, which I skipped past, which is two out of three Alzheimer's disease patients are female. Yeah. Two, two schools of thought here. A, we're living longer. B, 
we have estrogen receptors in our brain that end up dying off and we don't get that trophic support to the neuron. The neuron, the neurons have this, just like in business, you've got a supply and demand issue. And that's why amyloid exists. When you don't have enough supply to the neurons, you need to feed the neurons, okay, with adequate nutrients, which we'll go over. You need to feed it with blood flow and it needs to be supported and well rested through sleep. If it's not, and you wake up in the morning and you are under demand, the demands are your kids, your spouses, your work. You know, I live in Manhattan. I believe I'm at the mercy. As soon as I walk out my door, I'm under attack. I'm right in the West Village. It's crazy out here. So you have your brain, you really have to think about your brain as like, it's like the hunger games, right? You have to make sure you are feeding it and supporting it. So when it's under attack, you have all the support there to shield it. If not, that's when amyloid rises. So I think the best course of action. If you are taking advice from multiple different people to do zone two, to not do zone two, think about it in terms of individuality. I I recommend everybody get an APOE4 genetic test, which is one of the risk factors, as I mentioned earlier, for raising your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. We have an apolipoprotein E2, APOE2, gene. We have an APOE3 gene and we have an APOE4 gene. APOE2 is a protective gene. Now we get two genes, one from mom, one from, two alleles, one from mom, one from dad. So you can either be a APOE2 and APOE3. You can be a 3-3, you can be a 3-4. If you get the, if you have just one of the APOE4 genes, it raises your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. If you have two, like what's his name? Thor, Chris. Oh, um, Hemsworth. Chris Hemsworth, Hemsworth, has Hemsworth has two. Yeah. 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 So he's got two of the APOE4 genes. So he raises his risk of getting Alzheimer's disease 10 times. Uh, is, so, it, is it a 10 time risk with two of them? Yes. 10 to 12. So I'm a 3-3. Three, three. I am basically nullified. That's part of the average. If you are a two, three, you're protected. If you're a three, four, you raise your risk slightly two to three times. And then if you've got two. So if you are a three, three or a two, three, maybe you don't need to be as cautious as the people who have got, let's just say they've tested positive for APOE4 alleles, you know, two times. That just means that you are not a great metabolizer of fat because that's what helps. It helps with lipid transport in the brain. So you would then look at other courses of, of measurements in your lipid panel, for example. Okay. So we talked about zone two. Let's talk about some of the higher intensity cardiovascular output. So like sprinting, high intensity interval training, maximal interval training. What is your thought on that? And we can maybe oh, meander a little bit into VO2 max and the four by fours. And all the, all yeah. The, yeah. All the torture. We, that, I love yeah. VO2 max. Yeah. yeah. I do this thing called VO2 max Mondays. That's where I do all my sprint training. So it serves as a, a very protective mechanism against dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and heart disease. What we what we now see is that improvements in VO2 max correlate with dementia and cognitive decline. I first authored a paper that looked at the effects of resistance training, but exercise as a whole on mild cognitive impairment. And we see that people who were the fittest are able to have better episodic memory, better working memory, better reaction time, speed, everything like that. I think the biggest things that come from this is A, you're improving blood flow to the brain. But I think the biggest benefits here in terms of longevity is actually the effects that you get on your heart. And that was the, the study that I always cite from Dr. Ben Levine, which showed that you can reverse the age-related decline in your heart by 20 years. So if you are 50 years old, through maximal training over the course of two years, you can have a 30-year-old heart. Because what ends up happening as we age is we get stiffening of our arteries. That's just what happens. Our arteries that deliver the blood to the brain and the rest of the body become stiffer. Therefore, more narrower and therefore we don't get as much blood flow with every pump. What also happens is we get something called left ventricular hypertrophy, whereas the left ventricle, which is there to deliver the blood to the rest of the body, the ventricle becomes thicker so we don't get enough blood flow in that instance. But when we are able to reach our peak 
state, our VO2 max, we are exercising that heart muscle and we are making it more efficient. We are making it more durable and stronger. So when it is in the face of an attack, it can serve us and protect us in many ways. So what does VO2 max Mondays look like for you? So my VO2 max is the four by four principle where I'm doing four minutes on, four minutes off, and I'm going to my peak. Now that doesn't mean that as soon as the four minutes starts, I'm at my peak, pretty much probably getting to my peak at uh, when I probably like about 45 seconds into it because your heart rate has to climb up there. And it's a, the toughest session that I ever do, but I didn't get there, Steph, by just going hard. I didn't go to the four by four. I actually started off with 30 on, 30 off. Yes, good. Which is actually still great too. Yep. We can see remarkable improvements in VO2 max by doing that. Great. You can see remarkable improvements by doing two minutes on, two minutes off. But now I'm, I think I'm, I've gotten myself to the four by four and I only do it once a week. If I had more time in my week, I would probably do maybe two VO2 max sessions a week. I like one to two times, like your recommendations are just on par with what we talk about here on the podcast, like one to two times a week. I like that it's on a Monday because then you can just get rid of it. It's like yeah. done on your to-do list for the week. But to your point, 30 seconds on, you know, using the phosphocreatine system, maybe you're getting a little bit into that um, glycolysis at, you know, maybe the 30 second mark or whatever. But 30 seconds is like a true sprint, right? Like you're really, you're, uh, you might be going anaerobic at that point. So I do like that as a starting point because not uh, to your point, not everybody can just jump into like a four minute maximum. I mean, that is, that is a painful, you know, it, it, and now I don't want to like downsell it because I think it's important that everybody does something like some type of high intensity training uh, once a week for working on their peak. Like we talked about the base at zone two, but also working the apex of that uh, curve as well. But you can't just jump into four minutes. Like you're, you, you just don't have the yeah. capacity for it. So yeah. What I do recommend as well, I'm a huge proponent of, of testing, right? Because I, I, I'm, I'm a scientist. I always believe that you can't optimize what you don't measure. Yep. If you can get, you know, look around your, in your spots, look around for a local university or someone who does a VO2 max test, hopefully they are qualified and go and get your VO2 max tested. And some people get really scared. Maybe you're listening to this you're maybe 50 or maybe you're below that. You're like, I'm, I can't run at that speed. You actually don't have to run. We can just set you, or well, when I say we, you can just set the um, treadmill on a really high incline, yep. you know, say put it on 12 and just put it at four miles an hour. You you will get to your peak by doing that. So you don't have to run. But I think it serves as a really great starting point to know what is my VO2 max? What is my zone two? And then you'll be able to just track and measure your workouts using a heart rate monitor. Yeah. And just know that in the beginning, when you're doing anything new, you're probably going to suck at it, you know, but the beautiful thing about the human body is that you give it a stimulus and it adapts to that stimulus. So if you're consistently yes. doing high intensity training, maybe it's 30 seconds and maybe you need a four minute recovery. Like who cares? Like as long as you're doing something, your body mm -hmm. will get better at it. Right. We had, I know, yeah. you know, Kristen Holmes, she was on the show a couple months ago now. And she was saying, you know, even if you don't have, like, you don't have access to an exercise lab, you don't ha can't afford a heart rate, like just go to your local high school where they have a track and just time yourself on your watch or on your phone. Over time, you're going to be able to cover a longer distance, right? You'll be able to just run mm -hmm. fast, run longer in the 10 seconds that you've allocated. And you know that you can measure improvement that way. So I too like data and for, you know, you can, do, you can improve this at any point price point. Like you can get the lactate, you can get the lactate monitors, you can go all, and you can go to the science lab and all, and, you know, have the, you know, the straps on your, you know, the, the uh, monitors on your face and all that, or you can just go to your local high school's track and run as fast as you can for 10 seconds and see how much ground you cover. Like it's, it's also just, yeah. can be also just as simple as that too. Yeah, that's the the Cooper twelve minute run test, and you can do this and then and then work it out from there. So I love that. There's also two other forms of exercise that are really serving as neuroprotective, and we'll we'll move into them. They are the first one we'll talk about is resistance training, and this is my forte. This is what I study, and it's so interesting, right? Because resistance training, what I what I see as well, if I take a philosophical look at what all of this is, 
is it's not about the destination of growing bigger muscles. It's not about the destination of having a high VO2 max. It's about the journey because the journey is what's actually giving you the neuroprotective effects. And that's what I really love about this. So when we look at muscle or resistance training, we know that, okay, well, why are we even doing resistance training? You know, how does that apply to cognitive decline and brain health? Well, it applies in many ways. First and foremost is your, we, we hear this from my, my, my friend, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. We know that muscle is an endocrine organ and it's an organ of longevity, but why? Well, we know that it houses, you know, a lot of mitochondria. A mitochondria is the energy powerhouse of the cell where our ATP production occurs. We also know that it's a pretty much a storage sink for glucose. Who wouldn't want that to stave off? You know, it's a basically an insurance of staving off type 2 diabetes. But not just that. We, we've seen studies where we see, for example, the greater leg size you have, the bigger brain you have. And that may be true to an extent, but when we exercise those muscles, when we contract our muscles, we are releasing certain molecules. And I like to call the muscles, the pharmacies, and they hold these incredible medications in there. And these medications are actually called myokines. They're muscle-based proteins and they live within the muscle fibers themselves and they get excreted into the bloodstream when they are contracting. Let's just say you're doing a bicep curl, you contract your bicep and you can you, you release all of these myokines. They have so many beneficial effects on the brain and the rest of the body. We've seen that myokines, and I did this in my study, maybe you can link it below. We're seeing that from myokines, we're getting improvements in our executive functions. We're getting improvements in white matter and gray matter volume. So our gray matter is the cortex and the cell bodies. So we're actually, what we're doing, we're not growing new brain cells. Adult neurogenesis doesn't exist. We can't just grow new brain cells. That's not what we're doing. We are actually improving the synaptic density. So we are creating new synapses. You know, those connections I mentioned earlier during cognitive decline, if we, you know, if we're born with, you know, 5,000 to 10,000 connections per cell and they decline through cognitive decline, we can actually regenerate that synaptogenesis. So that's what's improving from these myokines. You're getting improvements in gray matter. What we also see in cognitive decline is that we get lesions along the white matter, the axons of our brain. So the white matter is the myelinated part of the neuron. That's generally the axon. We get lesions in those areas that occur just due to the buildup of amyloid, due to inflammation, due to lack of sleep. And these white matter lesions can actually be excreted or uh, I would say downregulated through the myokines. So I think that that's really, really eminent to point out. And not just that, I had a, a recent reel hit around 8 million views and it was the correlation between exercise and cancer. And what we found is that just as little as 30 minutes a day of exercise you can see a reduction in 13 types of cancer. But as it relates to resistance training and cancer, what we see is that resistance training can inhibit tumor cell growth. So when we have, and this was actually a really wonderful study that was printed in Cell Press and they used, they used prostate tumors. And what they found was that these myokines, what happens is when you have just, you're in stage one cancer, you've, you've formed a tumor, what happens is you can actually inhibit the growth of that tumor by killing off these circulating tumor cells through resistance training. So these myokines really are like medications and they're free, but in order to access them, you have to push your muscles, you have to contract them. Yeah. And these are off, these myokines often coin the molecules of hope. And I mm. notice this sometimes I am mad at the world and I'm like, I don't want to do go and do legs and I go and do legs. And all of a sudden my faith in humanity is restored. Mood and affect is better. Go. I'm high. I'm happy. And I think yeah. for, for a lot of women who are, again, coming back to this idea of this menopausal, this perimenopausal and menopausal transition, we see sleep changes, which we'll, I know we're going to talk about sleep today, but we also see mood and affect. We see suicidal ideation. We see depressive symptoms. We see anxiety. We see all of these things that happen. And these are all brain issues, right? This is a, maybe a restructuring or a volume loss in areas like the prefrontal cortex, which now 
you know, one of the mm. one of the many jobs of the PFC, of course, is to inhibit lower brain centers. And when we can't do that because we have volume loss from you know a sedentary life or what have you, that anxiety coupled with declining sex hormones and there's other things that are happening in the perimenopausal years can absolutely upregulate things like depressive symptoms, anxiety. I've had women who will say to me something to the effect of, I used to walk into work and I could make every decision. I wouldn't, you know, no problem. I could make, someone would present a problem. I would find a solution. And then when I turned 45 or insert whatever age, I became a former shell of myself. I couldn't make a decision. I was second guessing myself, you know, became like a mouse. And I think that part of the importance of what you're talking about, these peptides and these proteins that are released from the muscle as we're contracting it is to help with mood and affect, which I think, Mm. I, I think we can and should be talking more about it. Certainly we want to talk about like, listen, lift weights. If I can get you into the gym because you want a nice juicy, you want nice juicy glutes. Okay. I'll, I'll take it. I'll meet you where you are. And mm. if you're someone who's there and you're like, okay, I, I got the glutes and now I really want to think about how I can improve the quality of my life. I think that this is a very important point that you're making where every time you're contracting these your muscles, you have some of these like, you know, the BDNF and some of these other myokines that are going to help with volume, that protective or protecting the brain from decline. Yeah. And I think if you also take another philosophical view at what the brain and the mind are, and sometimes if we don't have a good supportive structure of the brain, sometimes, you know, there's, there are some camps of neuroscientists who separate the mind and the brain, then you talk to neurosurgeons and maybe some neurologists who believe that the mind doesn't exist. It's this perpetuated thought and perception of what we believe to be true, which is made up of a series of visual experiences that we've had throughout our 35, 45 years on this earth that has restructured the brain via neuroplasticity, which you then believe that is who you are. So I, when I look at this and I converse quite often with neurosurgeons, because part of my job is going into, is going into surgery. And when I I hear them talk about this, it makes me think about, well, how underserved is a 50-year-old woman's brain due to the loss of estrogen and maybe due to the loss of sleep and, and other stresses that they've incurred over the last, let's say, 10 to 20 years. How has that restructured the brain to make them believe that they are who they think they are, whether it is I'm an anxious person or I'm a depressed person or I don't have a good life? Is that really you speaking or is it just the, is it just the result of an underfunctioning brain? Right. It's a great way to think about it, yeah, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It, that's a great way to think about it. I love that. Let's talk a little bit. So you mentioned before leg size. I'm assuming we're probably talking about the quads because there's four of them. Lots of yeah. lots of le- you know mm-hmm. lots of lots of muscle there. One of the largest muscles in the body. When we're thinking about muscle mass and cognition, and, and you mentioned something, so I just want to piggyback on it. So you got to be lifting heavy. Is the goal muscle hypertrophy? Is the goal strength? Sometimes those are different, like the, you know, we can mediate like different outcomes, like you can train differently for a strength outcome versus a hypertrophy outcome. Is that what we're, is that, which, which of those is more important in your opinion when we're thinking about it in, in this, not, not to look good in your genes, but like, you know, we're talking about, you want, you're not training for your summer body. You're training for your old lady body. You want to be like a kick-ass 95 year old or 85 year old, whatever it is. What is the outcome that we have with muscle when we're resistance training? Is it hypertrophy as much muscle mass as possible? Or with the muscle mass that we have, is it to be as strong as possible? It's to be as strong as possible. And here's why. We see that there's a really great study that came out, I believe it was in China, and it showed that a a mild difference in, in in asymmetry of grip strength can mean cognitive decline. And they measured this via a a dynamometer. So they got the grip strength and they saw that if you've got a difference, if you're really strong on your right hand, but you're, you're less strong on your left hand in terms of grip strength, then what does that mean? And if there was an asymmetry of more than gre- greater than 10%, then you have a greater propensity of all-cause mortality and cognitive decline. So when I look at this, I'm looking at how can we get you stronger for several reasons. We can also think about bone mass density, which is 
evidently not just not just diminished, but we see that that plays a huge role in the perimenopausal and and postmenopausal state as well. So we're really working on strength for that. And then we also need to take into consideration something else, another subsection of exercise, which is neurocognitive training. I've coined that as neuroathletics training. These are the things that we need to be incorporated on a daily basis. And it pretty much involves looking at the visual system, looking at hand-eye coordination, reaction time. These things diminish as well as we age. And your your brain basically takes the notion of use it or lose it. And every area of the brain is responsible for something different. So if you are not working on your strength or your reaction time or your vision, those areas of your brain seem to decline and die off because they think, well, you're not using me. So I always look at strength over hypertrophy. Strength. And so this is why you're recommending, you know, as heavy, you know, obviously the literature is very clear, like anywhere five to 30 reps in any set is going to lead to muscle hypertrophy provided big asterisk, double underline that you are one to three reps from muscle failure. Or of course you can go to muscle failure if you like, but strength is a little bit more of a condensed range. So it's usually heavier for less reps because we are trying to, is that, is that what you would recommend when we're thinking about strength as the outcome is like heavier weight, but a smaller set or smaller reps, I should say. That's correct. But if we are looking at purely, Hey, Louisa, well, how do I get the, how do I excrete as many myokines as possible. What the literature actually says is you want to be doing 80% of your one repetition max, which is quite heavy, right? So let's just say that you push a hundred kilos or you, you can deadlift a hundred kilos. You want to be doing your actual training sets as four sets, six reps, of 80 kilos because that is 80% of your one repetition max. Therefore, I do believe that everyone, including myself, should be getting a personal trainer if you can or getting somebody to help you really work out what is your one repetition max. And then over, let's just say, a six to eight-week period, just working at 80% for that specific exercise. Okay. So let's get back to neurocognitive training or neuroathletics. Mm. Is that sort of like uh, there was an app I used to play with. It was like, I think it was called Duel and Back where you would, it would give you, okay. yes. it would give you like a picture and then another picture and then it would erase and you had to, and it would go away. And then you would have to figure out where in the screen it was. And then it would just get more and more complex. And sometimes there was auditory beeps as well as images. Is it, is that what you're talking about when you're talking about neurocognitive training? Is there learning a language? What are, what are some of the examples that you can give us that are going to keep our brains sharp yeah. as well? The best thing you can do is get two tennis balls and start throwing them to the wall overhand grip. Stand about a meter away from the wall and start throwing the ball to the wall with your right hand and just see if you can keep doing that for a minute. Switch over to the left hand and then maybe you want to alternate. Throw with the right, catch with the left, throw with the left, catch with the right. Then what you want to maybe do is stand on one leg. I mean, the it is the, the alter the, like you can do so many different types of this training. It's endless, right? I think I've come up with like a thousand different ways that you can just throw a tennis ball. You're improving so many things in your brain, but not just that you're improving the demand that you place upon it. Yeah. I get asked often, well, Louisa, can't I just do Sudoku? It's like, well, yes, but no, right? It's like saying, can I walk or can I run? I mean, running is going to yield greater results. So it's, you're really thinking, you want to think to yourself, how can I make something hard so my brain can kind of be put under stress, good stress, the allostatic stress, and build back from it? So it's like eye-hand coordination. Maybe you play with balance. You could do it on a BOSU ball. Yeah. Maybe like eyes are closed yeah. and you take out the visual cortex and make it even more challenging. Maybe mm-hmm. not the tennis ball. Maybe that's not a good example of it, but yeah. there can be balance challenges. We used to do in the clinic, is it the strobe test where it was yeah, the word I love that. the word was yellow, but it was it was green. And we would say to the person, say mm-hmm. the color, you know, but they would read the word yellow and they'd want to say yellow, even though Stroop test. Stroop, stroop, sorry, not stroop. Yes. Stroop test. Yeah. So that is and then we would get them to write, we would get them to do it forwards and we get them to do bottom all the way up, like all these different ways that you can sort of increase the cognitive demand of things. Yeah. And, and I bring my parents into this a lot, almost every talk I have, and I get them to actually do it with each other for 10 minutes a day. Just, I get them like go outside in the backyard first thing in the morning and they're throwing the ball to one another. 
So it's like a, a real, it's a great partner exercise as well mm. and get used to it. And then you can get harder and harder. And one thing that's really great is that you can go to CVS and buy like a $5 eye patch, like a pirate eye patch. It's used for if you've got an eye infection. And when you do that, you can throw the ball to the wall with that eye patch on and you're pretty much predominantly blocking out half of your brain, right? So it gets harder and then you get better eyesight. So That's I love fun. doing that, that type of training. Speaking of eyesight, are there, obviously the eyes, just basically an extension of the brain. When we think about visual training, I've had a couple of guests on the show who talk about, you know, we would, you know, we would always do sort of the nystagmus test if someone had a concussion or something in, in, in the clinic. But are there visual patterning when we look at like saccades, like when we look at different types of eye movement, like smooth eye versus kind of, you know, jumpy, your eyes sort of jump a little bit, let's say when you're reading. Are there, are there exercises that you like to do or that you think are healthy for either maintaining or improving vision, eyesight in any way? Yeah. So we do a number of different tests if you come on as a patient at Neuroathletics. And what we now see is that, you know, we've got one of the biggest risk factors is hearing loss. So we take eyesight into consideration. We do auditory processing as well. Mm -hmm. We do balance coordination, but what we what we're really testing is near and farsightedness and we're doing saccades testing as well. One great thing that we're doing to improve performance is we are using strobe goggles where we're blacking out certain parts of the eye and we are basically training the eye by blacking them out. We may black out the top quadrant. But the way that we assess that is we're using an EEG, which actually neurologically looks at your visual acuity in terms of timestamps. So we're able to really pinpoint where in the brain you're having a problem in your visual processing and we're able to work on it from that. So it's a very, it's very detailed, but for the everyday person, if you can just work on that, maybe stay away from diabetes as well, because the moment that you are getting these rises in blood sugar as well, this can affect your eyesight and the inflammation around that optic nerve. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a YouTube video that I watch. It's basically just eye tracking. So sometimes it's like you go up and down and then Yes. So there but that's something that I do to help with my vision because probably like you, I'm in front of the computer longer than I would like. And so yeah. I'm very as I'm, I'm sure sure most people are nearsighted, right? So my farsightedness is not super great. So getting out of nature, not having something like six mm. inches from my face, like my computer is right now, is is also very beneficial too. Yeah, absolutely. Going out in nature, looking at objects very far away, exercising outside regardless. Like I love running outside. I do it uh, almost every day. But yeah, just doing things like that, it's going to improve all of that. Let's talk a little bit about supplements. Certainly there's a, cer there's a couple of supplements I, I have in mind when I'm thinking about upregulating brain function. What are your favorites? So my my two favorites, first and foremost, is omega-3 fatty acid. We know that we've got certain receptors on our cells, on the outside of the cell that is responsible for the cell membrane fluidity. And we can actually improve the cell membrane fluidity and our the membrane of our cell through omega-3 fatty acids. You know, Stephanie, I think that omega-3 fatty acids have should be like an FDA approved drug. They have a safety profile of an FDA approved drug and they work wonders on on our brain cell. Actually, if you when you know if you look at the brain I mentioned earlier, it's three and a half pounds, 20% of the total lipids in your brain, the total fat is made of DHA, mm -hmm. which is one of the parts of omega-3 fatty acids. You've got EPA, DHA, and ALA. So you're pretty much feeding the brain what it's made of. I'm having around four grams a day. Now, I get so many people um, reaching out saying, but are you increasing your risk of atrial fibrillation? Uh, no. And that, that study that came out, I think it was about eight or nine months ago now, has been debunked. And I would say that you have uh, a much better chance of staving off all cause mortality by increasing your omega-3 index. So you have four grams omega of Omega-3 index, by the way. Sorry, four grams no, of- EPA, DHA. Okay. So total omega-3s is four grams a day. And then of that, probably one to two grams of DHA? It's, d it's two grams of each. Two, two grams of DHA, two grams of EHA. EPA. Okay. Now, when I'm actually having a stressful time, I will probably even go up to five grams a day because that's another thing that omega three do omega three does is it completely downregulates the inflammatory response. It's pretty much Advil in a better way. <laughs>
You know, okay. So I, I, I want to get to other supplements, but just, I have to say it like, why aren't more people talking about, like, I know people, I know, I, I know there are people that talk about omega threes. It's not, but there are, there's even sometimes I just like, it's not up for debate. Like sometimes I'll, there's, you know, social media influencers, air quote influencers that'll talk about, oh, they're rancid. You know, you should never take omega threes. It's like, well, I mean, just look, Yes. Well, and, and like you have to acknowledge the fact that most of the supplements are rancid. These are supplements are not regulated by the FDA and they are often unregulated, especially where you buy them. So what I would challenge you to do is look for third party testing. Yeah. And actually I've done a really great episode on my own podcast where I interviewed the founder of Momentous Supplements. And he actually taught me about the regulatory bodies that you know, go through and check what these supplements are. So it's not enough now just to have the certification. You want to have like triple or a quadruple certification on your supplements. So most of them are rancid. So then it becomes, okay, well, can I go to a quality manufacturer? So that's what you can do. The second thing to that is you said have more fish. Yes, but when you're living in America, you also have to realize that you are having rancid fish. Did you see the Netflix documentary Sea Spiracy? Oh, no. Yeah, it, no. it basically showed us what is living in our oceans. They were cutting fish apart and the fish were just opening up with like all these bottles of plas you know, plastic inside them. So we know that now that we're getting farmed fish, so we're not really getting the omega-3 fatty acid component within the fish. And not just that, you're also, the fish that we're eating now are just completely depleted of their own nutrients. So I actually turn to the EPA DHA supplements rather than trying to get it from fish. Okay, that's fair. And then that also furthers my my plan to move to Portugal and <laughs> just have fresh yes, fish coming out of the Atlantic, you know, or Italy or Greece or wherever I end yep. up. Okay. Wonderful. So we have omega-3s. What are some of the other supplements that are really great for well, right now? You and I share a, a love for creatine. So creatine helps with cell energy metabolism. And I really love that we're trying, and, and I love that you're doing this too. You're trying to get it out there for women because I feel like a lot of women are scared of creatine for uh, unknown reasons to myself. But creatine, I I can't imagine a life without creatine, honestly. I, I've i gotten it into my parents now. We sneak it into my dad's coffee. He still thinks it's uh, drugs. And my mother now is taking it five grams a day. Look, I, I don't think you can go wrong with it. In terms of, let's just say, let's just call out the myths. It doesn't affect your, your kidneys in any way. There is no evidence to show that there's disruption there. It doesn't increase DHT, which increases hair loss. It it might bloat you, it depends on who you are, but it also might not. And even if it does, you can cut down your creatine to two grams and maybe have that two times a day or three times a day. There's so many different ways around it, but you are doing yourself a massive disservice if you are not including creatine in your daily protocol. It doesn't matter when you take it. It doesn't de degradate. You you said you had Dr. Darren Kandow on. I asked him, does it degradate in high temperatures? No. So you can put it in your coffee. It has no taste. It is 100%, well, let's just say 99% safe and it's extremely clean and it's the most widely studied supplement on the market. I think that we need to get, we need to educate more physicians around this because the kidney damage one is the one I probably hear. I, for women, it's like the blo you knocked on the top three that I hear. It's the kidney damage, the hair loss and the bloating. It's like, mm. you're going to increase creatinine, which is sort of the waste product of creatine when you are supplementing with creatine. But that supplemental creatine doesn't mean that it is affecting your kidney function, right? So Darren, Dr. Kandal was talking about this when I interviewed him. I don't know when, I just interviewed him last week, so I'm not sure when your episode and his episode are coming out, but we'll make sure that one of yours is in the show notes. So if you want to go check it out, <laughs> that'll be great. And then the hair loss thing, I think this is, the, the, the hair loss and the bloating, I think are very uh, women don't want to be bloated, right? It's like, I don't, if it's going to bloat me, forget it. I already feel bloated enough. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't, the only way that it would bloat you is if you are like taking super physio, like if you're doing like that loading phase that you often yeah. hear of like the 20 to 30 grams, a which day you don't like need to do. Nobody needs to yeah. do, maybe if you're an Olympic Olympian or something, maybe, but you know, the Olympians are already taking it every day anyway. So I don't think that that's an argument. And the, and what it does is it, it kind of puffs up your muscles. Like it takes water mm. and it moves 
into the myocyte. So it moves inside the cell. So you just look like you have a beautiful pump. Like, you know, the pump you get at the end of the workout, you're like, wow, if I keep doing this, my shoulders are going to look like this in six months. You know, like that's what creatine mm -hmm. sort of makes you look like all the time. And then the, the hair yeah. loss thing, I think there was just three, three studies that sort of showed that it increased, it was all men and it increased DHT in I think there was a, st a statistically significant portion of them, but it was still within normal. It was still, yeah. it was still normal. So mm -hmm. it may, may, maybe if you're maybe a bit more androgenic, it might, if you have a lot of, you know, a certain proclivity, like certain genes are maybe more active than others, but it's still not like creatine. Like I like Darren, he talks about this idea of like resistance training is the cake you know, I forget what's the icing, maybe it's cardio. And then like the creatine is like the sprinkles on the top. It's like, it's so like the benefits that you're going to get are worth it for you to be supplementing with it regularly, but it's not the safety profile to your point is so well documented. It It's really wild that it is still such a hotly debated, you know, meanwhile, the people who are usually scared of this or, you know, having pop every day and they're having, you know, whatever, you know, but we want to debate, you know, the safety of creatine. It's, it's ridiculous. And also understand that there is a neuroprotective role that it plays too. So it protects your neurons against insults. We know that strokes dramatically increased in females as well. So mm -hmm. we have to take that into consideration. We know that we want to protect the brain. You know, they're actually showing that if you can dose a, an NFL player up with 20 grams of creatine, it can serve as being neuroprotective against concussions oh, and TBIs. Great. So that's some really great research that's taking place now. Yeah, so it can be like a pillow against these harsh insults. Again, helping with the support of the neuron. And then last but not least, as we keep moving further into the supplementation standpoint, I also want to just for a second, just think about what does the brain love in terms of food and nutrients? We know that it loves antioxidants. The brain loves antioxidants. So apart from the, the I would just look at nutrition for a second and I would definitely say that your brain loves berries. It loves blueberries. I eat blueberries every single day. I eat blueberries. I eat blackberries. Try and eat raspberries. If I can get organic, great, but I'm not going to not get a blueberry because it's not organic, right? So I'm getting my blueberries. It loves selenium. Every single day I'm having my Brazil nuts. It loves selenium. It loves antioxidants. And then it loves B vitamins as well. Yeah. So making sure that you've got adequate intake of B vitamins. I would, I, I'm a proponent of methylation tests as well, checking to see if maybe you have or the MTHFR gene genetic mutation, which means that you may not be able to metabolize B vitamins. So you may have to take a methyl B, methylated form of B vitamins to get that. I think everyone should get that test as well, because I think it's around 50, I don't know, get them from your fish then, like make sure you get fish. Oh, but the mercury in the fish. It's like, listen, you need omega-3s. You need to find a way to get omega-3s into your diet. Yeah. The all-cause mortality, like the, the, the reduction to your point in all-cause mortality is I mean, undeniable. It's undeniable. And I just, I, I find this, I don't know, bickering about omega threes and percent. I was going to say most people and have most people have some mutation in uh, in the methylation chain. It could be MTHFR, which is the most famous one because it sounds like a swear word. Mm -hmm. But in that methylation mm -hmm. chain, of course, there are many different steps, right? So certainly the COMT as well is yeah. the second yeah. one, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and yeah, and, and and I think actually, Stephanie, it's interesting. My best friend had, she had six miscarriages. It was very mm -hmm. unexplained. Mm -hmm. And she went and had a me methylation test and found that she had the genetic mutation for MTHFR and she had no idea. She started supplementing with the methylated B vitamins. She's now four months pregnant. And that just makes me so happy. Ah, bless her. Congratulations. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. So we have let me, let me use my working memory here. Hopefully it's in order. We have omega-3. It's the first thing to go is the working memory. So we got the omega-3. We have creatine, which we talked about, B vitamins, anything else that you love for brain, and blueberries, the polyphenols, anything else that you love. Or is that like the, is that no, really I, basic, the, the basic foundation? That's, yeah. that's the basic foundational. And then I include some sleep supplements. Like I, I am ensuring that my magnesium is at an, you know, 
at an adequate level. I'm having magnesium every day because it's just stripped from our vegetables, our green leafy vegetables. I'm having turmeric now twice a day because it inhibits the uh, NF-kappa B pathway, which is involved in the inflammatory response, which is great because I experimented and I actually had an, a C-reactive protein of less than 0.3, which is really great. And then in order to combat my cortisol and the fluctuations of cortisol throughout the day, I'm having not ashwagandha, rhodiola. Oh. So it's not a very much brain health supplement, but it is a, a supplement that I'm taking. When you have patients in the clinic, do you look at homocysteine at all? Is that something that you monitor? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And we're, uh, we've got a cutoff point of eight. So we're really trying to get homocysteine down to an eight. Again, if you have the mutation in MTHFR, you may have homocysteine level of 12. It's a protein that builds up and it can be strongly linked and associated with cardiovascular disease and dementia. So we're aggressively trying to bring down homocysteine. Yeah. Great. Lovely. All right. So if we come back to the Louisa pyramid, we talked about exercise at the base, which includes mm, resistance. We missed the middle one. What's the middle one? Sleep. Sleep. Ah, let's talk about, yeah. let's talk about sleep. What would you like to know? Well, I will say, I think most of us are very cognizant of sleep hygiene. So cold yeah. room, dark room, try not to binge Netflix or Instagram and doom scroll, you know, an hour before you're going to sleep. So we're trying to reduce some of the blue, blue light into the eyes at that time. Although you do need blue light in the morning, but what are some of the beyond sort of the basics in, that we've that I've just mentioned? Are there ways that you like to augment sleep? Because this is maybe the biggest maybe the biggest thing that perimenopausal women will mm. complain of. It's like I've turned forty four and now mama can't sleep. Yeah, and you know it's it's scary. I, I I love sleeping. I'm scared if that ever happens to me. But there's many things that we can take into consideration. First of all, I would actually, you know, there is something where you can actually test your melatonin levels as oh. well to see like if yeah, there it's a 24 it. hour, so you can actually see if you've got rises and fluctuations in your melatonin. Mm. So there is a test that you can do for that. And then there's also different things that you can start to implement. First and foremost, consistency is prob probably sits at the foundation of the sleep fitness uh, protocol, if you will. So making your making a consistent bedtime. At neuroathletics, we say that 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. is the best thing you can do. If you have tried everything, you've like, I've slept in a cold room, I'm sleeping on a temperature-controlled mattress, then there are different things you can take. Obviously, I don't know if people are doing any form of HRT, but I know that when we've seen female patients and they're supplementing with, you know, they're, they're including an estrogen gel, they tend to sleep better mm -hmm. at night. Mm -hmm. Then there's some supplements that um, I include, which is just helping me as well. I do myo inositol at night. I'm doing, I'm doing my magnesium L3 and 8. If I've got a racy mind, not that often, but I, I'll, I will supplement with GABA, gamma amino butyric acid. I do all of this 20 minutes prior to sleep. And there is a really great, uh, another hack, if you will, it's putting a pillow under your legs and trying to maybe, great. I've actually seen now, mm. I've actually seen beds that are actually getting you to, you know, it's, it's, it's doing this. I don't know what you call it, but it's in a hospital setting. It's called Trendelenburg right. okay. where your, your, your legs are rising further above your head. Yeah. My ortho mind is going like Trendelenburg test is a, is a test for the glute, the nerve, the gluteal nerve, but that's not, the, that's not, that's yeah. not the same thing. Okay. So, no. so, yeah. so elevating the legs. What about, I know this is going to sound really silly, but it works for me. Wooly socks. <laughs> Sometimes when, <laughs> really? yeah. so I, I think I heard it, was it Matt Walker? Who, I think it might've been Matt Walker. I, I'm going to, I'm going to credit to him until I figure it out otherwise. But he was saying something about when we're thinking about manipulating body temperature. So you mentioned temperature controlled mat mattress. I love the eight sleep. I know you've talked about eight sleep as well and work with them. Honestly, it's changed my life. I love cooling it down and then sort of being able to me. warm it up over, over, over the course of the evening. But before I had that, I would put on woolly socks at night, which is so sexy, by the way. My husband just loved it. Yeah, oh yeah. But what it, what Matt was saying, I think it was I think it was Matt who was saying that it sort of warms up your feet. So women typically were all usually colder in the extremities anyway, and so it can pull the blood. I think he used the word like 
charms the blood, you know, the English beautiful way that they have of speaking, charms the blood away from the core and into the extremities so that you can lower your core body temperature and then sleep, which is one of the hallmarks of being able to like, it's like, is your room cold and dark, right? So maybe you don't have, you know, you, you are not able to afford, let's say, a, a sleep cooling mattress cover, but you can maybe put on woolly socks or something like, or oh. or something where you are warming up the extremities and thereby cooling down the core. I thought it was the opposite where you want to keep your feet outside of the sheets to expel the, the heat that goes through your body. Oh, well, yeah. Let me see what I can That's find. A, no, no. Yeah. I, I, yeah, please find it and send it to me because I think that that would be phenomenal. Yeah. So- we have sleep tips. We have L- magnesium L3 Nate, which I also love. I probably take that every night. I think that I somewhere between 500 megs to, if I'm very stressed, it's like a gram. I'm taking a gram of it in the evening. Uh, I will be re- really cognizant on the fact that sleep is a very, very underrated performance tool as it relates to amyloid beta because we do get the clearance in deep sleep yeah. of the of the amyloid beta through the glymphatic system. Notice I said glymph glial cells because those glial cells that I mentioned earlier, the immunity cells, they shrink. And remember how I said to you that that amyloid is there and attached around that cell too. So when that shrinks, it allows for the cerebral spinal fluid to move past the glial cell, move past the other cells and completely wash through the perivascular space, wash out that all of the debris and toxins that build up during the day. Yeah. Great. And there's earlier research now, and, and I'm still on sleep. I'll get there. There's earlier research. There's early research now showing that even like becoming hot and getting into a sauna can help get rid of these, get rid of these plaques that build up from amyloid too. Right before bed. Yeah, if you can. I mean, like in a perfect world, I, I'd want an infrared sauna right next to my bedroom. <laughs> yes. But Manhattan, yeah. maybe, you know, and not just Manhattan, but any major city, like it's a big footprint, yeah. right? So if you have the space, mm-hmm. amazing. But there's also things like sauna blankets. You can also take a really warm bath. That's yes. also another option, maybe a hot shower or something like that. And is that is that mediated through? Is it like a rebound? We're hoping that as we warm it up in the shower, once we get out, we kind of start to yes. cool down and that's what helps us. Sleep. Yeah. Yeah. And then look, I I don't know where the research stands on excreting the heavy metal and BPA exposure. Mm. I'm seeing research early studies to show that that does have an effect, but I'm still it's still very early, but I love getting into the sauna if I could do it every day I would, but now I'm doing it probably three times a week when I have time. I love that. And if you miss your cardio session, <laughs> <laughs> There's some oh, evidence yeah. to suggest yeah. that it, you know, that it also mimics, you know, the benefits that you get from, car- not that you should, I'm not saying skip your cardio, but if I, if I mm. am choosing what to do in the gym, I will always choose weights. Like I love mm-hmm. to lift. I love to lift. So it's, I know I see it on your Instagram. I'm dying to come and work out with oh, you. Oh, I can't wait. It's going to be so much fun when we, yeah. when we get together and do it. But I, I, I have to mentally, like it's, it's more of a mental lift for me to get on the Stairmaster or the treadmill or run outside as you seem to do so effortlessly than it is for me to just go in and do an hour or whatever it is of whatever I'm lifting. I love it. I'd love to. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So we have cardio, we have, we talked about sauna and now I, I should also say that after the, like you've talked about the basics, like we've talked about the exercise, the cardio, the sleep, we've talked about supplements, you know, the sauna is not, and this is where I sort of take a little bit of, I think sauna is important. I have a sauna at home. I have a sauna blanket. I have an infrared sauna as well, but it's not, it's like, let's major in the majors. If you are lifting regularly, as we've been talking about, if you are doing the cardiovascular training that Louise has outlined, you're getting adequate sleep, like, and that's what you can do. Then you are 80%, 85%, 90% of the way there. What we're talking about now is the sprinkles on top of the cake, right? The accessory items, I call them. Yeah. The accessories. And what I, what I often bristle at a little bit, again, in sort of this world of social media is that people will talk. I've heard one individual, I want to ask you about cold plunge, but one individual in particular is like, there is nothing that will burn fat faster than getting in a cold plunge. It's like, oh, I can give you several things that will burn, like cardio will burn more yeah. fat than getting in a cold plunge. But I'm going to say his name. It was Gary Brecker. <laughs> I, was Gary. I often call him out yeah. on the podcast. Yeah. Like, oh, and he said some crazy, th- I think he said something like, this is separate, but I just was like, what are you talking? He said, you know, the Celsius, it's like an energy drink. He said something like it has 
a hundred, I can forget the numbers, like a hundred times the amount of cyanide that is, that is, you know, required by the FDA. It's like, no, it's cyanocobalamin. It's like, it's, it's like, it's B12. It's not, it's not cyanide. You can't make this stuff up. Yeah. 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 And look, I do want to finish up on something that I think should be a vital sign and be included in the, the sleep and exercise and one that's often not spoken about. Yeah. And that's the power of happiness and social relationships relationships. Great. Really great follow-up, 80-year follow-up study from Harvard that showed that the people who had a, a great, who had better brains at the age of, I think it was 100, were the ones who had stronger social connections. And it didn't mean a, you know, it, well, it, they just, they, they said relationships, but they didn't mean it in terms of a romantic or, or spousal relationship. They meant the people that you spend the most time with. And and when I looked looked into the research a bit more, it basically showed that if you have someone deep within you that you know that you can trust, you know that friend, right, Stephanie? Like I've got my best friend and she lives in Australia. You know, we don't talk so often, like she's married now and it, it's we don't talk, but she's she's been my like I know if something were to happen, she is there, and it brings me so much comfort. And I can only imagine how that must feel, you know, for a woman as you go through your older years, your sixties, seventies, eighties, and if you've got two or three of those people that you have fostered and nurtured for thirty or forty years, it does play so much. It has so many benefits on your brain health. So I would actually start to question your social relationships. Who is the top five people that you spend most time with and are they conducive to your brain? Unfortunately, and it's only been probably this year that I've become really stringent on who I spend my time with. And I've had to cut some people out, not due to the fact that I don't like them. It's like, you're just not good for my brain, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. for several reasons. And I've become really strong on that. And it's it's made me more focused as an individual. And I, 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 I love that. I think that what you brought up is such an important, it's like the unsung hero of longevity is having, whether it's familiar, familial or community connections. I think it's part of the reason why I'm so in love with pickleball. Like I've just recently taken up pickleball. Oh. I cannot get no. enough of it. it is no, so I'm a good. tennis player. You're Don't a tennis say that player. to me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, how dare you? That's not a real how court. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I see the same. Like I see the same people every week in my league. I'm in the beginner league, like, oh. I, but like, you know, oh, you're in a league too. Yeah, I'm in like a league. I don't think I go- we can be friends. I thought I could fly there and hang out with you, but I don't think we can do that now. Well, I am saying as we are recording, I am literally packing up my house. We are li- we are moving to uh, another home, and it backs onto a tennis courts. And I am on the wait list. I'm going to become a member at this tennis place, so I'm going to learn how to play tennis. And then you can pull me on proper technique. But bracket sports, I know there's something about it. I love my previous gym. There was squash courts. We would do. Squ- I would play squash. I've taken up pickleball because my current you know thing has a pickleball court, and it's so much fun to see the same people. Yeah. And like, you know, it's just, it, it's, I don't, so I have like my pickleball friends, I have, you know, my neighbors, you know, so there's all these different sort of like my gym friends. Like I see the same, you know, I often call them like my best, you know, my best friends, like I'm a, you know, gym rat. So I see like the same people I go mm. at the same time every week. It's like, Hey, what's going on? You know? So I, I think mm. that that's so important to feel like you belong somewhere, you know, it could be in your family. Like you could be very, you know, I know know, your heritage is Greek. Certainly my kid, my children's father, Greek, very, like it is a very tight, like family is absolutely everything. And this is why we see Mm. the Greeks, the Italians, there are many, you know, the, the Japanese, these, you know, these, these cultures that have very, we'll say solid and fortified familial connections, we see them living longer because part of that mm-hmm. is, I mean, part of it's like you're in Greece and you're having the best food ever, but it's also <laughs> because you're, you're, you're <laughs> with your family. You grow, like people don't ship you off to, uh, you know, a home. You, you grow with mm-hmm. mom, you see, you become a grandmother, you get to spend a lot of time with your grandchildren and they keep you young and all of that kind of beautiful you know, cultural norms that we see in some of these centenarians and super centenarian cultures across, across the globe. Yeah, absolutely. Last question is on around the cold plunge. I love it for recovery. Mm. I don't do it. Mm -hmm. I don't pair it with leg day. I do it the day after leg day because I need the help with the recovery. What are your thoughts Mm -hmm. on cold plunge? Do you like it? Not like it? 
We know that it doesn't burn fat love more it. than anything else, Gary, but no, I love it. Yeah, look, I love it for for many reasons. One is the improvements in our mitochondria mm. because we know that we can induce mitochondrial biogenesis, grow new mitochondria when we are getting cold. I know that it improves by 530% increase when we get in there of norepinephrine mm. which is our which is that molecule which is both a hormone and a neurotransmitter that is involved in vigilance drive motivation we get a huge surge in dopamine as well and i love these two i don't have i don't have adhd but i'm actually seeing uh, really great research that's come out on on the effects of cold water immersion for people who have adhd and not to mention when we think of depression right? You can actually put somebody in a severely depressed state when you deplete them pharmacologically of norepinephrine. Actually, if you have ADHD as well, you know, if you've got ADHD, you would often be taking a norepinephrine uptake inhibitor. So it's the same as just getting into an ice bath, right? So I love that for people who have got ADHD, which I think is on the rise right now. So I love it for that reason. I love it for the, I love it for the mitochondrial uh, biogenesis. And I also love it for the vasoconstriction reasons. We know that there is a pathway without getting too much into the weeds. It's called RBM3 for Roger. And we know that this can serve as a protective mechanism when the cold shock proteins are able to go into the brain and cool it down. They're doing some really great research in Australia at the University of Queensland or Griffith University, I believe, where they're expen experimenting with football players who get hit and take a hit to the head, how can they cool the brain down immediately within the first 15 minutes? They're doing ice, they're doing ice packs for the for the neck, they're putting their heads in buckets of ice. So I think it can serve a great purpose there. I also think that that would be great to use for post-stroke patients who experience an emboli in a in a certain vessel in the brain and getting them to cool their brain down straight after as well. Have you had Dr. Tommy Wood on your show? Tommy is my advisor, actually, for okay. my doctoral degree. <laughs> I was like, you know who you need to get on your show? Yeah. <laughs> your, him your and advisor. I talk right. quite, quite often, okay. yeah. I was going to make the introduction, if not, because we talked about when he was on the show, he was talking, like, as you were talking, like, wow, this sounds a lot like Tommy. Okay, so. Um, yeah, the, well, there you go. He, I, he, he, I'm trying, yeah, that's great. Yeah. We should tell him that. Maybe it'll give me some marks. It gives you some extra marks. You know, Louisa, I have to yeah. say, this has just been, I didn't get to half of my notes because we just went on. I know, this. you had so many notes prepared. We will come back for a part two for sure. It has been such a delight and I'm so thrilled that we did this. Thank you so much for coming on. If people want to find out more about you, your clinic, you, I, I, I know that you see patients. I don't know how often or what the, what that looks like. But if people want to find out more about you and your work, can you direct them to where they might reach out or find more about you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you can just go to my Instagram page, Louisa Nicola underscore, and everything is just linked there in the bio. We've got a website, neuroathletics.com.au and all of our information is there too. Awesome. Thank you so much for today. This was great. Yeah. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks for having me. All right, all right. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And I must give you the obligatory legal and medical disclaimer here. This podcast, Better with Dr. Stephanie, is for general information only. And the advice, recommendations we discuss do not replace medicine, chiropractic, or any other primary healthcare provider's advice, treatment, or care. In the consumption of this podcast, there is no doctor-patient relationship that has been formed and the use and implementation of the information discussed are at the sole discretion of the listener. The information and opinions shared on this podcast are not intended to be a substitute for primary care, diagnosis, or treatment. In other words, guys, be smart about this. Take it with a grain of salt. Take this information to your primary healthcare provider and have a discussion with him or her to make the best choice that is for you. Remember, I am a doctor, but I am not your doctor. And these conversations are meant for educational purposes only. 